Comeback Lover. It's another day here at the Comeback Team Studios. This is your host, Beck Lover, and I have a very interesting guest. This is a man with many talents. He's a knight in the Malaysian royal family. He's now my new friend, Sir Marco Robinson. Welcome to Beck Lover and the Comeback Team. How you doing, sir? Thank you for having me, Robert Beck. Great to be here, mate. Pleasure to have you, sir. You're my first royal family member here. God willing, I'll have the Prince of Albania on soon, as my family is directly connected to the royal family in Albania. Nice. That's very but nice. But you're the first one of royalty on the show. Cool. Sir. And I'm not just saying sir. <laughs> and I'm not just saying sir to be respectful. It's, that's what you call someone um, who's been knighted. Yeah, you too. But you can call me Marco. It's okay. Marco, you have an extraordinary life. A lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of ups again. You've learned how to come back from a lot of different things. You've done some extraordinary work, which is extremely important, and I want to get into that a little bit later. And uh, how you became a, a, a part of the royal family is a part of your story also, and uh, kind of what you've been up to these days. But let's kind of go backwards, and that's always what I do first. I like to kind of take my guest on the journey of your life, you know, where it began, where you're from, and kind of how we got to where we are today. So welcome again, and uh, where are you from, Sir Marco? Marco, I'll call you Marco, but where, call, where, me Marco. Where, where, call me Marco. So I'm in the UK right now. So I'll tell you my backstory. So you know who I am. Your audience knows who I am. So when I was two years old, my mom left my dad. He was a gambler. He spent everything on gambling, everything, my mom's money, his money, everything. So she was 23 hours two. I had no idea what was going on. She went to live with a mom in the North of England, which is very cold. She was on the doorstep. And what I didn't know at that time is that she'd been sexually abused by her stepfather since she was four years old. In fact, one time she told me that he put his hand on her breast and said, I didn't marry your mom for your mom, I married your mom to get to you. Crazy. I only heard, yeah, I only heard that a few years ago when she was 73 years old because she kept it inside, right? No one believed the story when she told everybody in her family at that time. So she was terrified of going back to that kind of uh, place. And then her, steps to, her stepdad said on the doorstep, it's either me or them to my grandma. And my grandma said he can't stay. So we slept in the park in, it was snow, it was freezing cold for three nights. We nearly died. Eventually we got taken in by friends of friends of friends out of pity. And um, my mom was not educated. She was a casual worker. So she would work in different towns across the country just to basically pay the bills. And we were basically officially homeless for quite a number of years because it was either couch surfing, it was sleeping in parks, garages, people's cars, whatever it may be. And then she met my stepfather, who was basically a schizophrenic. I mean, he was really nice and affable, really funny. But inside the house, he was very violent. He had to have his own way. And, you know, I, as, as a child, I used to see my mom get hit a lot and beaten up a lot. And I tried to fight that. But, you know, when you're eight years old, you can't do fuck all about that. You just can't do anything. You know, I would run upstairs when I got home and cry myself to sleep under the bed or I'd run away for the night and stay somewhere. And I was the guy, I was the boy in the classroom that was looking out the window at the back of the class because school didn't mean anything to me. And I was also very quiet and I was very, I had bright ginger orange hair, which I tried to dye so no one can see me. And I got bullied to shit everywhere I went. I mean, I went to 50 schools before I was 12 years old. Damn, man. So yeah, it's bad, it bad news. So you know, one day when I was 15, it kind of, the bullying stopped because there was 20 kids in a garage punching me, kicking me. And then I saw red. And then the next thing I, know, I remember is I was running down the road, chasing 20 fucking boys down the road, thinking, come on, you fuckers, is that the best you can do? And that's the first time in my life, really, that I'd fought back because I, I just chose I'd had enough of being bullied. So... That's what I did. And when that happened to me, that's the first time I felt kind of like validated as a person and kind of, you know, that I actually fucking existed. So that happened. And then my mom left my stepfather and she met someone else who she's still with, by the way, which is great. They've been together now like 40 years now. Um, and then I got a few jobs. I didn't have any qualification, no high school diploma, as you'd say in the States, nothing like that. And I worked jobs, casual jobs a lot until I got to the age of 21 and I got offered a job in direct sales selling timeshare. Now, I don't know if you remember that, Beck, those days in the 80s. 
Do I remember a timeshare? You know, I've sold $150 million worth of timeshare. I don't know if you know that. Oh, my God. Yeah. Woo-hoo! yeah. Well, we got that in common, bro. Well, it takes greatness to recognize greatness. Okay. So now you, got- you sold it in its in like, you know, the heyday of, you know, when it. Anyway, that was the late 80s I, when I was selling that. And were you selling for anyone big or was it. Was it I was the- working for a company called Global, Global Marketing. Okay. And it was actually the, an American company. Were you selling? In, were you selling it in the UK or like Marbella, Spain, and all that stuff? Or, or, we were selling it offsite in the UK, but the the resort was in Tenerife. That's interesting. I guess we're going to trade some more stories when we meet up. We have five resorts in Tenerife. So I went there. I was I was the worst salesperson in the company because I was so shy still, and I wasn't kind of like used to doing. I wasn't used to meeting people face to face. But I didn't want to go back to my hometown because of that fucking scarcity. I just didn't want that shit anymore. So I thought, fuck it, I'll do this. So I was really bad at that job. And six weeks into the role, I was going to get fired by my boss. And then, you know, I lived about five miles away from that office. And I was thinking it was about four months behind with the rent or something like that. And my, my internal question was, during that time at sales, why it was, why am I such a loser? Why, am I, why do we keep failing? So it got me down. It depressed me, blah, blah, blah. And then when, when my boss said, you're going to get fired, it kind of it triggered the point of desperation at where I'd had enough and I didn't want to go back to my, but the choice was I can go back to my hometown and work casual jobs. I didn't want to do it anymore. So I decided to change my internal question to how can I succeed? How can I succeed? I had nothing to lose. I had no money, no friends, walked to the office. How can I succeed? So I, I kept saying this, asking this question for like 24 hours. And then the next day I went to work, the top salesperson took me to one side. And I was surprised because no one ever talked to me, especially the top closer, right? So he said, listen, Marco, I know, you've, I know you're hurting. I know it's, it seems bad, but I used to be like you. I said, what do you mean you used to be like me? He said, well, I was homeless. I had no money. I was a loser. I'm not saying you were a loser, but I felt I was a loser. And someone helped me and changed my life and gave me this kind of message that, it's really not about the other people. It's about what's what you want to do inside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a book. I want you to go home, read the book, and don't stop reading the book until you get the message. So nothing to lose. I went home and read the book. And I read it eight times, did go to sleep. And that's the first book I ever read from cover to cover. And by the time I read that the eighth time, I was absolutely, unbelievably in control of my belief system. I had more belief than I'd ever had in my life because I read that book at that moment. My suit was wet through and they, they, they said, this Mark, you can't come in, your suit's wet through. We're gonna to have to take you home. So they gave me a lift home and they never gave me and helped me before. So I knew something was a bit different. So we got back into the office and I'm like, electricity was running through me. I just couldn't wait to see my prospects before I dreaded every customer. Now I couldn't wait. And the first couple that came in to see me, he was blind, she was blind and they had a guide dog. So I'm thinking to myself, how the fuck am I going to sell timeshare when they can't even see me, let alone timeshare, right? So because I'd shifted internally, I said, listen, guys, you're going to sit there for four hours. You're going to spend $10,000. You're going to give me a credit card and you're going to love it. You're going to love this. You're actually going to say to me, this is the best thing we've ever seen. We can't wait to to use it. You're going to give me a big hug. And they said, no, we're not. We're fucking going right now. (laughs) And it was a battle for like six hours. It turned to six hour battle. And at the end of six hours, the guy leant over to me, gave me his credit card. He said, listen, Marco, you were right. There's $10,000. This is the best thing we've ever seen. We love it. Gave me a big hug. His wife gave me a big hug. And I was like, wow, where did that come from? And that was a huge moment for me where it was a huge moment that changed the, the entire rest of my life. You, so, you, I just have one question, on. please. What was the book? Uh, the book was called Bring Out the Magic in Your Mind by Al Karam. Now, you've probably not heard of that book because it was written in 1957 by an English magician who was amazing in his time, in his heyday. And it was a book about psychology and the power of belief, but it was the right book at the right time. It was the right message at the right time for me. So coming back to that moment again, the first thing I said to the, 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 the couple was, why did you buy from me? Now, I know as a salesperson, you're not supposed to say that, right? 
but that just came out because it never happened to me before. And they said, this is your first sale. I said, yeah, this is my first sale. And they just couldn't believe it. And they said, listen, the reason we bought from you is because you transferred your belief from you to us. And we believed it. We couldn't wait. To, in fact, we would have bought it hours ago, but you just kept going on and on, right? <laughs> so that was a huge moment for me. And from that moment, you know, I became salesperson of the year, the youngest sales manager in the company, 22, um, broke the record in the company. And then I got offered jobs in that industry all over the world. I, mean, I got headhunted all over the world because of the results I got in the industry. And I got headhunted by a company in Malaysia called Tanko Resorts, which was a public company. Okay. And it was the best opportunity. They were paying me a great high salary to get in and turn things around. And, you know, they owned about 25 properties. So it was, it was a big company. So, you know, I was married then. I took my six month old daughter over. We lived there. We started doing, I started turning it around. And they hadn't started sales yet. They, they, they were kind of doing home sits. They weren't doing like deck sales or anything like that, which you understand. And then in 1997, in about September time, the Asian economic crisis hit the South, Southeast Asia, where George Soros basically devalued all the currency. And they couldn't pay me. They couldn't pay me any more money. And they said, listen, Mark, we can't pay you anymore because of the crisis. So... Again, that was a pivotal time for me. I thought, you know, what, what should I do? But what I did was, is I decided to stay and I decided to innovate the product. So I decided to take a week's timeshare and split it into points. So you could stay at a resort for like half a day to a day. You didn't have to stay for a week. So I changed the membership from a $25,000 product to a $5,000 product and made it affordable. What the good thing was is in Southeast Asia, the population has savings six times more than Americans. So it was just about having the right value. So I took that company from 10 million US and I turned it into over 2 billion US within a three and a half year period. Now I was doing 6,000 sales a month of timeshare back. Wow. I had 2,000 salespeople. I had 1,500 telemarketers. It was a monster. It was an absolute monster. And now, I made a lot now, of money. You, and you're, you're not consider, are you considered the creator of the point system? Or are you just and what, one, one of them. One of them. I thought, that, them. I thought yeah. that was something that was started by, uh, I forgot which company in the US. Was it? Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. But in any event, that's, you know, coming from that world myself, and I worked for all the big ones. I worked for Marriott, Hilton. Yeah. I worked for Wyndham briefly. I worked for Hyatt Vacation Club briefly. Uh, but predominantly with Marriott and uh, Hilton, you know, very high-end product. Yeah, so I was invited to speak at all the conferences about the, what product I innovated and because of the results I was getting from it. And I went to, what's it called, the big time shake? Arda? Arda? Arda, yeah. I spoke at Arda for like three years running. So how long were you in that industry for? Since 21 to 34. So I want to just hard pause here. I want, I want the, yeah. the, the, the people that are listening to understand something here that, yeah. um, you know, what changed in you was your mindset. You know, we can yeah. accredit it to the book, which, you yeah. know, that's what, that's, what's beautiful about an amazing book or an amazing author who, um, has a way with words that can completely change your mindset. Yeah. You know, you were Sir Marco, you had that greatness within you. But the way you were looking at life, the negativity, as they say in the industry, it's a very, and I, I do believe in that. That is one lesson I've learned from the timeshare. There's nothing harder in the world to sell than timeshare. I don't care what anyone says. That, that's a no, fact. The hardest thing you, learn, you learn how to sell timeshare, even if you know that that's not something you want to do the rest of your life. I highly recommend people go into that industry, even if it's for a year, because yeah. it'll change your life. Yeah. Period. It changed my life. Yeah. So, uh, but one of the greatest lessons I learned in that industry, besides becoming a monster, in sales is the mindset and how powerful your mind can be and looking at prospects and prejudging situations, judging people. You could have judged that couple for being blind. Most yeah. people that Ooh. work in the timeshare industry that don't make it would have looked at that couple, been prejudiced against them for being blind. They would have assumed I have no sale here. I can't show them the pictures. There's no way they're going to fall in love with the product. 
for them, it doesn't matter that they're blind. They could be sitting in their home. What's the difference for them? But instead of you, but instead of you allowing that to stop you, yeah, you found a way, and that's the point here. The point is that your mind changed. Yeah, you expanded the way you thought. That book helped you. So if that book changed your life, I highly recommend it. I'm adding it to the list. People should definitely pick yeah. up that book. What do you call that book? One more time. Called "Bring Out the Magic in Your Mind" by Al Quran. By Al Quran. Yeah. A L, first name, second name K O R A N. Okay, just like a Quran, almost like the the book. Yeah, exactly the same spelling. It was an amazing book. So but it, it was. It also hit me at the point of extreme desperation. But you made a lot of money. You know that industry to get to the level you're at. I know what kind of money comes into this. I know. You know we don't need I to talk. I had three million pounds in the bank in 2001 from Timeshare. Wow. Right. Yeah, that that's already you already that's after your living expenses, just money. After the living expenses, but you know, I worked it. I mean, I work in nineteen hours a day, seven days a week. I had twenty five sales decks. You yeah, know, I, I managed. Incredible. I managed a team of forty uh, in Manhattan, and, and I was putting in crazy hours myself. So I know exactly. You, know you, 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 burn, you burn out in that industry too. If you don't take breaks, yeah, you, you burn out. There's a lot of emotion in there. So what happened was this is what happened. One day I was giving um, a motivational session in the office and I collapsed and had a heart attack. Huh, there you go. That's exactly yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm so not laughing at it. I'm just saying, but hospital. literally that, the, the, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work and stress and, you know, it's always, you have to perform. I started going, this is why I walked away from the industry. I started going with ambulances myself and I, I walked, I walked away from half a million dollars a year. I just, no, I, I, I had to walk away as well. And, because it was very political at that level it was very political you know my boss's wife wanted got my job and it was all fucking politics bullshit the greed was just unbelievable it's the corporate world so marco the corporate world disgusted me in the end and then i came out of hospital and i found out my wife was having an affair with my best friend fuck yeah that was a double fuck because i'd known them each i'd known them each for 10 years so the double betrayal was just more painful than the heart attack. It's devastating, right. man. Yeah. So you have a heart attack. Yeah. You're betrayed basically at work, because I know what that feels like. You, you do the right thing. You build this monster, and they shit on you, because now... I was being stabbed in the back every day. Now the machine is up and running. You know, you're expendable. Yeah. It's not exactly. about that you're the best person for the job, and that's why I hate the fucking corporate world. That's why I recommend anyone that truly has talent. Until you work for yourself, you'll never control your destiny. Absolutely true. And then you go through this physical issue, and then all of a sudden you find out the two most important people in your life, with the exception of your mom and dad and your, you know, maybe siblings if you have them, yeah. both betray you. Both betrayed me. And so it was how did you find out? Well, a few people were kind of tell were, were trying to tell me, but I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't believe it. I just didn't believe it. And I overheard a phone conversation one day where she told him she loved him. And he told her he loved it, right? And that's when I went fucking nuts. So I left the house. I mean, I had two kids. One was three, one was one year old. And it was devastating emotionally to me uh, because I didn't know those people. I didn't recognize those people anymore. And I left and, um, you know, because I didn't have a dad per se, of course, the, the, it wasn't her that pulled me back into that. It was the kids. And she begged me to go back for like, it took me a year to overcome that. And the biggest fucking mistake I made was going back to her. But you did it for your kids. I did it for my kids. It was a big mistake. Because my kids don't even remember that time. They don't even remember that time. Now, at the same time this was happening, I played the stock market. In fact, I bought stock in the company that I was working for because they did a stock issue and pushed us all to buy the stock, which went to $3.00 but it came down to 10 cents. So I lost pretty much all my money. Wow. Yeah, they played us big time. So I left the company and became a default, basically entrepreneur. And what I did then is I vowed there was no fucking way I was going to work for anybody ever again because of the way I'd been treated. Because I did all that work. I gave my soul, my life nearly, and it wasn't reciprocated. It was, I was fucked over. So that was a big lesson for me. And I, I, then I started doing consulting. I just did like worked for other companies and did sales training for them, built, slowly built my, uh, you know, my income stream, 
worked in other positions and I did that for like, I don't know, two, six years. And then I said to myself two things. First of all, I need to get out of this marriage. And secondly, I need to make a million dollars this year for me. And thirdly, I wanted to write a book. So the first thing I did is sat down and write and wrote a book. And it was called Close the Deal and Suddenly Grow Rich. It took me six months to write it, three months to edit it, and it went to number one. So I'm signing, I'm signing uh, in bookstores, borders, all the big bookstores in Asia, doing book tours, all this kind of stuff. But you know, books don't bring in money. So I said, right, how can I make a million dollars? So what I did, I said, right, I used my experience, I said, right, okay. Hotels, could I get any rooms that weren't being used? So I used all my connections and found a lot of rooms in hotels and resorts that were not used. And what I did, so right, my idea was to put these hotel rooms in a voucher and call it a vacation incentive. Now, you will know about this because they probably use free vacations to get people in to see you. Absolutely. So I basically invented this in, I don't know, 2006. It was the first one in the whole of Asia to do it and pretty much the rest of the world in, in terms of the way I did it. So I got these free rooms, packaged it into a voucher, and I would sell this voucher to, I wouldn't go to small companies, I'd go to like Shell, oil and gas, Ikea, BMW, and all the companies bought them. And I charged them $50 per voucher if they bought a thousand. And I, I never forget my first sale was to a, a, an electrical retail group of a hundred retail outlets. And they bought 10,000 vouchers and they paid me half a million dollars on Christmas day in 2007. <laughs> it was fucking incredible. I'm like, fuck. Right. And the, the next week after that, I said, right, I'm sorry, darling. I can't stay in this marriage anymore. I left my wife. And um, that was the best day of my life, by the way, up to then, because when I left my wife, it was like freedom and I had the money. And it was an amazing time for me because when it was in 2008, I reached 40 and I'd really had my life together, had everything together. And not to give anything, she was a great mum to my, to my kids. And it wasn't the affair that broke us up. It was the fact that we just weren't on the same page. You know, if I, if I wanted to take a risk, she would say, no, it's too risky. So I had to pull, I had to pull myself in a lot and I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it. So when I left her, it was, you it felt was, like, just, you life was just great. You felt yeah. like not only were you fighting life, but you have to fight against the person that should be supporting you to go after what you're trying to go after. I had to fight in that relationship every single day. And I remember, you know, during the tough time, she said she wouldn't take the kids out of private school. So I had to find $3,000 a month for fucking school fees, as well as other things. So I'd, I'd have my own business and I'd have to work two fucking jobs to pay the school fees. It was horrendous, mate. So anyway, this is 2008. And in 2009, that company made $12 million doing vacation incentives, B2B sales. And then I said, right, how can I leverage and scale it? So I created an opportunity for people to buy into the company for $2,000, get a hundred vouchers, sell them themselves and be agents for me. And I, that, that went really well also. So the next few years after that, after the subprime, um, I thought, how can I invest some of this money? So I bought quite a, quite a, a lot of USA real estate. I did really well with that. And I also got people from Asia to come to America to buy it because it's so cheap in certain states of America where the yield is like 20%. So I did that for a few years, but while I was doing this, I had some really bad people around me that weren't doing the work because I wanted to franchise that business, the vacation business all over the world, but it, I wasn't getting the help and I didn't have the time because of the property side of things. And the big, again, I made a mistake. I didn't scale it properly. And I had quite a lot of competitors come in who worked as agents and copied my business model and diluted what I had which took away a lot of the work that I'd done. Now I was okay for money. I was doing real estate, but it wasn't the same as it was before. And then I was with a girl that I fell in love with probably deeper than any girl I'd ever been with before. She was fucking beautiful. We felt, I fell in love and it was really bad. I mean, it was insanely in love. And because of that insane, insane love affair, I was taking my eye off the ball in business. If that makes sense. And one day I'm so in love and she meets someone and I never, uh, that's it. She has an affair, uh, but it was worse than my wife in a way, because I was really in love with this girl. 
So two times now I've been betrayed. And I'm thinking, what the fuck <laughs> is happening to me, you know? So I try to get it back. I try, and by that time, by the way, I was 25 kilos heavier than I am now because I was drinking three bottles of wine at lunchtime and napping in the afternoon because my lifestyle was a very rich kind of lifestyle. And she always said to me, well, you don't need to get uh, lose the weight. I like, you, I like you the way you are, blah, blah, blah. And after that, I realized one day that she wanted to keep me kind of ugly and fat because it wasn't a threat to her kind of thing. So anyway, I tried to get it back. I couldn't get it back. And I was in a really, I actually bought sleeping pills because I was in so much pain. And I really considered doing that. And then two of my great friends, my best friend is a bodybuilder. He won the, the Mr. Britain three times. He, he was top 10 in Olympia. My other friend was a model, international model. He modeled for Calvin Klein on every, all the brands you can think about. And they said to me two things. He said, Marco, get in the gym, get a six pack. And my model friend says, you can be a model. I said, I'm fucking 46 and 25 kilos overweight. There's no <laughs> way I'm going to be a model. I've got a fucking ginger hair as well, right? My self-esteem was low, you know? But they instilled in me and they really stuck by me and were really loyal to me. And I, I got in the gym and within about four months, I got a six pack. And I went to a, a model casting for underwear to model it on a, on a catwalk. And I'm going, am I, but I just wanted to do it to prove to myself that I could do this, right? So I'm in this model casting and there's about 150 fucking guys that are 22 years old and there's me, 47 years old. So the, the casting agent says, guys, I want you to take your tops off. So we all took our tops off. And then the casting agent kind of middle muddled away through the crowd. And she pointed over and said, you old guy. So I looked over because it must've been me, right? I said, you mean me? She says, yeah, how old are you? I said 47. And she said, right, I'm gonna tell the, 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 the people here two things. One, you are the first person I'm gonna give this job to because you've got the best fucking body I've ever seen. And secondly, she said to the rest of the models, you better look at this guy because your, your bodies are nowhere near this. And this is what you need to work towards. So that was a huge moment for me because I'm 47. I've got, I've been casted in this fucking Calvin Klein underwear catwalk show. Right. And this is like an unbelievable experience for me. And I'm, I'm flying so high at that time. I got myself, I got my shit together back. I got my self-esteem back. And that girl that kind of dumped me after I did all this asked me back. She asked me to go back with her. And of course, you know what I said, right, Beck? Don't tell me you said yes, man. No, I said, go and fuck yourself. No way. That's my fucking, that's my night. Yeah, I, I learned my, I learned, okay? So I went, fuck off, fuck you. And um, I had a great time. <laughs> and then Channel 4 TV, the biggest TV station in the UK, they called me and said, listen, Marco, we've heard about your life story. It's incredible. Would you like, we would love you to come on TV and give a house away to a homeless family and address the social housing issue because many people couldn't afford a house. The same in America as well. And I said, I, I would love to do that, you know, and made the TV show in 2017. It was called Get a House for Free. I gave three houses away, paid the mortgage off for three homeless families. And that for me, was a very emotional experience because when I was giving the house away on the last day of filming, I had this flu and my eyes started filling up and my nose started pouring out and I couldn't really speak. And I said to production, I can't do this. You're gonna to have to cancel the, the filming. And I said, we can't cancel, we can't cancel it. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this new person walking around in the garden, this lady and said to the production team, who is that lady? And they said, well, oh, that's the psychologist. I said, what the fuck is the psychologist doing here? And they said, well, she's here to counsel the woman you're going to give the house to because she, she won't be able to cope with it psychologically. I said, no shit. They said, yes, shit. So this psych psychologist came up to me and said, Marco, you don't have flu. There's nothing wrong with your nose and your eyes. You're having an emotional reaction to an unresolved childhood issue. And I'm like, I didn't know what to say. But five minutes later, the flu disappeared. My nose was clear. My eyes were clear. And I went in the house and gave the house away. And after I gave the house away, I cried every day for three weeks. I bawled my fucking eyes out for three weeks because I was able to give house away to a girl 
who was 23, whose daughter was two years old, who were homeless. And it came full circle to me of why the fuck I'm actually here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, man. It was an amazing moment for me that. That's one of my and, dreams, you know? That's literally one of my dreams, what you just did. What you did well, for three people. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. And I've always had that dream of me returning to a very poor part of where my family comes from. Well, do it. You can do it. Anything's possible. My cousin Anything's just did it right now for some people. I was very proud of him uh, in Albania. He went and found some really poor people and built them houses. You know, so it's, it's, I'm glad that someone in my family was able to do it. Yeah, and it's an amazing. It is the best thing. Giving something you, don't, you didn't have is the most fulfilling experience because you're able to change people's lives. So after that, I started my charity called Freedom X, which is to get homeless people off the street, not just off the street into fucking soup kitchens, but into accommodation and rehabilitation where they can learn a new job or start a micro business. And I've actually got a hostel in Barcelona now where I take people off the street and do it now, even in COVID. I think we've, we've, we've helped about 100 people now. We have 100% success record. That, I love to do that. Now, the other thing that was going on at the time, which you don't know about, and the reason I've actually been, I would say I've been invisible for the last three years. And the reason I've been invisible is because I've been in a massive litigation lawsuit. And the, the story of this is, of course, I was into property. And my, families were, my family was seeing me getting rich and making a lot of money. And my cousin, who'd known me all my life, we were like brothers, was in a bit, you know, he said, why don't we do property together in the UK? Let's do some stuff together. But he didn't have a lot of money. He had some property, but he didn't have a lot of money. So being, being the dick that I was, I went into business with him. And it was going quite well, blah, blah, blah. And then we bought a building in Manchester that was 51 apartments. Cost us millions to buy this thing, but and we took a loan out and personally guaranteed it. And then when we got the keys for the property, the fire cladding on the outside of the walls started falling off. And of course, my conscience was, there's no way in putting people in that house because they could die if there was a fire. Now, there was a building in England called Grenfell, which burnt down and killed hundreds of people because of bad fire protection that you may have heard uh, in the news. Yes, yes, very yeah. familiar with it. Now, that my building was a year before that happened. Now, when I found this out, what I had to do was I had to sue the developer, the building insurer, the building inspector, the fucking surveyor, the bank, the seven people I had to sue, right? And my cousin pulled out, didn't want to, uh, didn't want to know, wasn't interested. So I had to spend about 2.5 million pounds in fucking legal fees fighting this fucking thing, right? And the bank came after me and they came after my mum's house and they were going to take my mum's house away. And I thought, there's no fucking way you bastards are doing that. And there was one point where they sent a fucking, basically a, a compulsory purchase order to, to, to take my mum's house away. And I collapsed in the fucking room and nearly had a fucking heart attack. And I, that night I thought about fucking topping myself because they were going to take away my reputation, my mum's fucking house, and put my mum on the street as well as me on the street. But I woke up in the morning and said, you fucking bastards, I am going to fight you. So it took every pound I had to fight this. And then I found out my cousin had been embezzling money at my company very cleverly by doctoring the bank statements and stuff like this. And also his mum had been doing it. But because I was the, a director of that company with him, I couldn't sue him because I was responsible for that as well. I just knew he was doing it and I did everything I could to, to get him litigated, which I still am. So I sued everyone and I won, I won the whole thing, right? And the bank fucking pulled away. And now I'm suing the lawyers who arranged it because they didn't give me the right advice, which is still ongoing. But right now I'm about, I'm about 45 million pounds down because I lost that opportunity, lost all the property to my cousin's stupid fucking mistake because his job was to buy the property and inspect it. And I was based in Asia selling it. So this went on and on and on for three years. And finally, I would say in about October last year, I came out of that bunker and I thought, you know what? I'm sick of being fucking invisible anymore. I need to go out and get out there. And at the same time, Clubhouse came along and I started an online business in January. And that's like, I was researching online for about a year. And I, I spent all my last money on 
investing in coaches to teach me how to do it. It was about hundred grand. And in January, I started my, my first online business and it went through the roof. It went absolutely ballistic, which it still is, by the way. Sounds um, like you, sounds like you spoke to someone like Bradley. I know Bradley, but it wasn't Bradley. One, one, there was a few. One of them was Tanner Chidester. Um, one of them was a guy called Andy Harrington. One of the guys was Rudy Mayer. One of the guys was Ty Lopez. There was quite a few people that I paid a lot of money. So to. you started an online training. I started something called the online success formula, which then the success is an acronym for seven pillars that I teach people how to sell online. And the first letter of success is story. And I found out that the most important thing in your life is your story. Your greatest asset is your personal story. Or But I didn't realize that until I, until I started telling my fucking story on Clubhouse. <laughs> and, and I'm for getting the, and for those all of you that, For those of you that don't know what Clubhouse is, it is an application that right now is only available to iPhone users, but it is a type of social media where millions of people connect and speak with their voices instead of text and picture. We actually talk to each other. It's also how I met Sir, Sir Marco. We met through the app. We actually talk in real life. And there's yeah. stages and speakers and, you know, the crowd can participate. It's like virtual conferences, but it's very interactive. It's very addictive, very interactive. It's very transparent in terms of when you hear people's voice, you can pretty much tell if they're, they're going to fucking rip you off or if they're genuine or not. I mean, you know, on that app, there's still a lot of assholes on there, but there's also some nice people on there. And me and Beck, I think we met in a couple of rooms. I think one of the rooms was Valentine's, a Valentine's room one night. And we just got on really well we connected like that and you know that's where i am right now and the knighthood I'll explain the knighthood so in about 2016 i was in malaysia my friend told me his friend was blind and he couldn't fucking go get out of his house because he, he wasn't allowed a guide dog i thought what the fuck is that about and then, then i discovered there were 350,000 people in malaysia that could not go into public places because guide dogs were not allowed because the muslim culture stigmatized dogs uh, and the inside of their homes Yeah. Right. So I thought, fuck this, this is really bad. So I thought, what can I do to, to get this out there? Because Malaysia is a very close shop. They don't like outsiders. They, they kind of like, I don't know, there's a lot of shit going on there and they're very private. And they don't like people to find out what's going on. They have like something called a sedition act. You can't protest against the government. So anyway, the, you know, I thought, right, let's make a film. Let's call it Are You Blind? Let's buy a guide dog from China. That was the closest place. So the, the guide dog cost 15,000 US dollars to buy the fucking guide dog and bring it into the country. Made this film called Are You Blind? Which was a, a film of this blind guy with the guide dog going into taxis, public transport, shopping malls, and being refused entry everywhere that he went. So what we did was kept going back into the shopping mall and getting further and further inside. And at one point, we were held at gunpoint and taken into the office. And this, we were all filming this. And the police came and stuff like that and said, you can't come in, blah, blah, blah. And it was a 15 minute film. A week later, we put the film on Facebook and it got 15 million hits. Wow. It went fucking bonkers, right? And we got a, a huge global outreach of fury and outrage of why blind people were not allowed guide dogs in Malaysia. And then the King's assistant called me. I didn't believe he was actually calling me And eventually I found out it was true. And they said, listen, we need to see you urgently. And I, to, be honest, to be honest with you, Becca, I was quite scared because I kind of exposed something. And, you, you know, sometimes, sometimes it don't go so well that. Like, off with his head. Yeah, off with his, off with his head, that kind of thing. So anyway, I met the king. Um, and they said, Mr. Robinson, we don't know whether to um, make you disappear or give you a knighthood. Just and like that. Laughed. He said exactly that. So... This is what he said. And he said, listen, um, we've exposed something we didn't even know. You've embarrassed the country, but have also helped a lot of people. And we just want to say thank you very much. And we want to reward you. And the, the pictures and stuff are on my Instagram of me getting the, the knighthood and stuff. Um, and that was an amazing... I didn't do it for the knighthood. I just did it to make a difference. It wasn't... I didn't, I didn't expect to be awarded anything for that. I just wanted to make a difference, you know? So... The story of my life is, we're very similar, Beck, is that I don't give a fuck what people think and I want to make a difference, right? I'm outspoken, but I'm balanced in my opinion. I'm not a fucking David Icke. 
right? I'm not an extremist. I'm just a human being who wants fucking justice and the right things for people who are less fortunate. That's really the story of my life. I'm a fighter. I fight. Even if there's nothing there, I fight if it's the right thing to do. So that's my story, my friend. And of course, we missed out the film Legacy of Lies. That's the last thing <laughs> um, that people talk about because that film Legacy of Lies took me seven years to make that feature film. And that feature film was a dream I had as a six-year-old kid looking out the window in a classroom when my life was shit. And what I did is I pretended to be fucking James Bond. That, that was my life in my head. And I, that, that became a reality uh, this, well, last year. And it went to the top four on Netflix, which is, that was the most phenomenal achievement for me in terms of, fuck me, that film's on fucking Netflix at number four. And that was a, a fucking idea in my head at six years old. Crazy world, right? No, you're crazy. But I like it. Crazy. <laughs> you're fucking yeah. crazy, Sir Marco. But in a yeah. good way, a good kind of crazy. Yeah. Because if your dreams are not enough to make someone think you're crazy, then they're not big enough. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. When Rolex makes a watch, they ask him what time it is. He's the most interesting man alive. He is Sir Marco Robinson. Fuck, man. You know, it's just, you know, one of your stories is enough to impress the world, right? I mean, seriously, most people, and I hate to say this, but I hope they're listening. They just become content with mediocrity. Yeah, they they they, exactly. they know in their heart of hearts. I, I'm so mad at myself for doing what I'm doing right now. I should have done this fucking 20 years ago. I knew my whole life what I wanted to do. I knew in my heart of hearts what I was supposed to do. I knew my destiny and I turned my back on it for so long. And even if I never make it to where I know I'm going to make it. But all praises to God. I can tell you that I can die a happy man right now. Well, that's an amazing thing that many people couldn't say. I can die a happy man because I, I did what I wanted to do. I made this show. The thousands of people and now almost a million people who have viewed the channel, the feedback I've gotten, the thank yous, the you changed my life. Just one person, Sir Marco. I said, you, right hit, now, you hit one person, that's enough. I said, if I save a life, that'll be the greatest reward I've ever gotten in my life because that's what the comeback team is all about. Not giving up. You are the epitome of what this show is about. So many ups and downs, so many ups and downs, so many battles. There's so many people that give up. I've lost people I love, man. They just gave up, you know? Yeah. And there's always a reason to get back up. We're all going to die anyway, so why the fuck are you going to off yourself for? I don't care how bad your life is. I don't care what you're going through. At that moment, yes, it seems hopeless. We've all been there. I've been there. But you can't admit defeat, there's always a reason to get back up. You're the proof of it. You've done some extraordinary... You impacted the lives of millions of people in, in a country. In one country. Forget what you do in the UK. Forget the families that you got homes for. But literally what you did with that little documentary changed the lives of millions of people who can't yeah. see. Something that so many of us take for granted. And you brought attention because a lot of these third world countries, and I come from them, I have family that have... Uh, disabilities in places like Kosovo and Albania, and these are not the best environments for people with disabilities. I mean, no, yeah, America still has a long way to go, and we've come a yeah. long way, right? We have the ADA, the American Disabilities, and all that stuff. There's still a huge amount of discrimination, you know that, right? Uh, absolutely. The smaller the country, the more economically challenged the country is, the more discrimination there is, you know, so... It's enough these people have to deal with what's, to me, is very heartbreaking. I've had a very good friend of mine, childhood friend, who, who lost his eyesight from a tumor exploding in his brain that he never knew he had and literally lost everything overnight. His fiance, his job, his eyesight, everything. And to see what he's gone through and what he goes through. And he still somehow, somehow still, still manages to be positive. Yeah. I mean, this guy broke my heart into a million pieces. He was one of the most charismatic people in my entire life. He talked his way into Harvard, this guy. I mean, that's how charismatic. What would a fucking C average? You get my point? Yeah. yeah Charisma. Yeah, point. To see him overnight lose everything is another reason why I tell people, you know, get up and use what you have while you still have it. Your, your, your time while you still got it. Your health while you still have it. Because you're not going to have it forever. If there's something you want to do, what the fuck are you waiting for? 
Yeah. Everyone gives you this blueprint in your mind of how your life should be. The most influential in my life, obviously, is like your parents, the people around. You finish school, you should get a job, you should go fucking eat shit for the rest of your life in some cubicle. Fuck that. Yeah. You know, if you have the ability, and even if you don't, there's no reason why you can't start walking in the direction of your dreams, man. And no one's saying you're going to get all your dreams. But anything's better than what you got right now. Yeah. And you're not going to get it unless you fight for it. So, Marco, you went through some crazy battles. I mean, you, you talk about it very casually here. But literally from your inception to this point, and you're still battling certain battles. Yeah, I am. So what do you want to say to anyone out there that's listening to this right now who's fucking at their rock, rock bottom, and they just found out, like my friend David Nano Rodriguez, former heavyweight boxing champion of the world, said, I didn't realize that rock bottom had a basement. <laughs> yeah. And what that you, basement has a fucking undercover floor that's invisible. What yeah. do you want to say to that person that may be listening to this show for some inspiration? Uh, for I some would more? say to that person. They've I lost everything. Everything is complete disaster in their life. What would you say to them? I, I've been that person so many times. And what I realized was that the only person that's going to get out of that fucking basement is you. You've got to decide to do it. And you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to just fight and just there's still going to be fear there but you know courage is not the absence of fear courage is doing what you need to do despite the fear and you know fuck all this mental health bollocks you've got to fucking grow a pair of balls metaphorically and you've got to fucking fight now the easy thing to do is go to the fucking doctor and get antidepressants right which is a coping mechanism the easy thing to do is blame other people become a victim. The easy thing to do is do fuck all and decide that your life's fucking over because most people's lives are over at 25, but they die, but they buried it. Most people die at 25, but they buried at 75, if you know what I mean. So for me, most people's, uh, most people are fucking dead because they're in a mediocre universe, like you said, where they're so comfortable, but they're so afraid to change that world because they, they fear that they might get judged, they might get fucking, they might get failure, they might lose all the money. And that's why people stay where they are. Um, but, you know, you've got you've to get out of that fucking basement yourself. And, you know, the, the two triggers in life, which I learned from uh, the great person who is Tony Robbins, is there are only two triggers in life that get you to do fucking anything, desperation or inspiration. And anything in between those two it's a fucking comfort zone and it's a waste of time. So you've got to have desperation. You've got to have inspiration. Desperation is where you go to rock bottom and you get out of it because you're so fucking desperate, but you need inspiration to pull you out of that rock bottom as a, con as a consistent continuation. And, you know, inspiration is your vision. It's also looking at people who've got what you want that were worse than what you were or the same as, as your inspiration, but it's having that vision of what you want to do. And my, my saying is, if you're not fucking acting in it, in that vision, you're not fucking acting on it. You have to be in that fucking movie of where you want to be. And that's what life's about. And secondly, the greatest power you have as an individual is not in the future and it's not in the past. It's right in this moment because you can control everything in the moment you're in. You can't control it in the future. You can't control it in the past because if you look at the past, you get fucking depressed because of regret. If you look at the future, you get fucking anxious because you think, oh, I might not be able to fucking do it. So your greatest power is in this moment now. That's your greatest strength and you've got to play to that and stay in the fucking present. Folks, this man is the proof. No matter what you've been through in life, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hopeless it may seem, as long as you still have air in your lungs, you can always make a comeback a comeback sir marco follow him down below follow him in his social media get his book check out his course i'm glad to call this guy my friend can't wait to see him in the flesh you can catch both of us on clubhouse and this is beck lover and we'll see you next time on the comeback team beck lover.